Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone and welcome to the course Developmental Biology. I am Dr. Priya Goel, Assistant Professor in Department of Zoology, Deen Dayal Upadhyay College, University of Delhi. In today's lecture, we will discuss embryonic induction and also the fate of germ layers. This is the syllabus of Developmental Biology that we are following. We are done with Unit 1 Introduction. We are continuing with unit two, which is about early embryonic development. In this, we have discussed gametogenesis, fertilization, polyspermy, cleavage, types of blastula, fate maps, early development of frog, and chick up to gastrulation. In today's lecture, we will discuss the topics of embryonic induction and organizers, and also we will take up the first topic of unit 3 that is the fate of germ layers. We will study about the embryonic induction and organizers. We will also study various experiments done by Hans Peeman and Heild Mangold in the field of embryonic induction. We will also discuss the experiments done by Peter Newcope and Osamu Nakamura. We'll come across important terms like new poop center and Speeman organizer or the primary organizer. We'll discuss the molecular basis of Speeman's organizer and regional specificity of neural induction. Then we'll take up the types of embryonic induction and organizers and we'll discuss the fate of embryonic germ layers. Let us begin with the first part of this lecture that is about embryonic induction and organizers. Gastrulation lays down the formation of three germ layers that is the ectoderm, mesoderm and endoderm. Now these three germ layers have to form certain organs which is known as the process of organogenesis. During organogenesis, embryonic induction is an important phenomenon. So embryonic induction is the induction of embryonic cells to develop and differentiate into organs in the presence of other cells. Here we have two major tissues, the inducer and the responder. Inducer or the inductor is the embryonic tissue which exerts the inductive effect by producing signals in the form of paracrine factors. These paracrine factors are secreted into extracellular space to induce the neighboring cells. While the responder is the cell or tissue which respond to the inductive effects of this inducer. And competence is the ability of a responder tissue to respond to the inductive effect of the inducer. Evocators are the chemical substances emitted by an inductor tissue. The classic example to understand the concept of induction and competence is the building of vertebrate eye. In the initiation of formation of vertebrate eyes, paired regions in the brain bulge out and approach the surface ectoderm of the head region. The head ectoderm is competent to respond to the paracrine factors which are secreted by these brain bulges. Now these brain bulges are the prospective optic vesicles. And the head ectoderm is induced by them to form the lens of the eye. In return, the prospective lens cells also secrete certain paracrine factors which instruct these optic vesicles to form retina. So the vertebrate eye is formed by reciprocal paracrine interactions between these two regions, the prospective lens and the prospective optic vesicle region. Now here, the head ectoderm is the only region which is capable of responding to the inductive effect of the optic vesicle. As we can see, this is the complete head region or the ectoderm of the head region. 
and then first it is written that the normal induction of lens happens by the optic vesicle however if the optic vesicle is placed under the trunk tissue it cannot induce the trunk ectoderm to form the lens also if the optic vesicle is removed there is no lens formation by the surface ectoderm of the head also if any other tissue is placed under the head ectoderm other than the prospective optic vesicle or the brain bulges then also no induction of the surface head ectoderm to form lens can occur so this is a classic example in which we know that the there is an equal importance of inducer as well as the competent tissue or the responder there have been certain experiments by various researchers in the field of embryonic induction in which predominantly there is role of hans spemann his main focus had been on autonomous specifications versus inductive interactions in 1903 spemann performed an experiment demonstrating the nuclear equivalence in neutrinous tenuis cleavage So shortly after the fertilization happened in nude egg, Spiman ligated the nude zygote with an infant's hair in the plane of the first cleavage. Then he partially constricted the egg, causing all the nuclear divisions to happen on one side of the constriction only. Eventually, at 16 cell speed, one nucleus escaped the ligature and came into the non-nucleated side. Now cleavage began on this side also, whereupon Spemann tightened the ligature until the two halves were completely separated. As a result, after 14 days, twin larvae developed. However, the first was slightly more advanced than the other. Thus, he concluded that the early amphibian blastomeres are genetically identical. That is, they have identical nuclei. and that each cell is capable of giving rise to an entire organism another experiment done by spemann was about demonstration of asymmetry in the amphibian egg spemann performed a similar experiment but in this case the constriction was longitudinal in one set of experiments the constriction divided the gray crescent area into two equal halves Each plastomere developed into normal larva. In another experiment, the longitudinal constriction was perpendicular to the plane of first cleavage, which separated the dorsal and ventral regions instead of the left and right side. So, normal embryo developed from the dorsal region, which was having the gray crescent, while the other part developed into simply an unorganized mass of cells, which was known as bostic, meaning belly piece. Dorsal structures like neural tissue, notochord, somites did not develop in this bostic. So this concluded that the gray crescent area contains cells which are committed to the initiation of gastrulation. In another experiment done in 1918, Spemann performed some transplantation experiments in early and late gastrula of two species. of nudes which were different in their pigmentation he took the non pigmented triturus cristatus and dark pigmented triturus tenuis he took these two differently colored embryos so that he can identify the host and donor tissues on the basis of color after the transplantation experiments so in this experiment prospective neural ectodermal cells of an early gastrula of one species when transplanted into the prospective epidermal region of the other gastrula of different species the transplanted cells gave rise to the epidermal structures only while when the similar experiment was performed on embryo at the late gastrula stage the transplanted neural tissue developed into neural structures only and prospective epidermis Formed skin, irrespective of the location wherever these tissues were transplanted. So, from this experiment, he made the conclusion that the cells of an early gastrula were uncommitted, but the fates of late gastrula cells were determined. 
Some classic transplantation experiments have been done by Hans Peman and his doctoral student Heilt Mangold. In 1924, this experiment was done by Spimen and Mangold, which demonstrated the organization of secondary axis by dorsal blastopore lip tissue. In this experiment, between triturus tineatus and triturus cristatus, the dorsal blastopore lip was explanted from triturus tineatus and it was implanted into the host tissue, triturus cristatus into the region of the ventral side which was supposed to become belly region. However, it was seen that the dorsal blastopore lip continued to form the structures which it was supposed to do as if it was present in its original location in the triturus tineatus. This pigmented donor tissue underwent invagination and it entered the gastrula through this secondary invagination in the host embryo. Now the pigmented donor tissue continued to undergo cell differentiation and it formed corda mesoderm and all the other mesodermal structures that normally develop from any dorsal lip. Eventually some induced secondary structures could be seen in the host embryo and uh, here it was even seen that somites were formed from both the donor and the host tissues. Neural tube was formed by both the donor and the host tissues. The secondary embryo was beginning to be formed and ultimately a complete secondary embryo was formed face to face conjoined with its host embryo. Similar experiments have also been done to produce secondary embryos in other amphibian species in Xenopus also. So Spiemann and Mangold uh, derived from their experiment that there was only one tissue in the gastrula which was uh, autonomously derived which had the capacity to undergo self-differentiation and that tissue was the dorsal blastopore lip cells. So they called this dorsal blastopore lip cells and their derivatives that is the notochord and head endomesoderm as organizer tissues. Now this dorsal blastopore lip induced the host ventral tissues to change their fates so as to form a neural tube and dorsal mesodermal tissue that is the somites and pronebric tubules. They also organized the host and donor tissues into a secondary embryo with a clear embryonic axis that is the anterior posterior and the dorsal ventral axis. So here the concept of organizer came into being. They also found out that during normal development, these dorsal lip cells organize the dorsal ectoderm and transform it to form a neural tube. And they also transform the flanking ventral mesoderm into lateral and dorsal mesoderm, thereby determining the anterior posterior body axis. And they called this phenomena as embryonic induction, which is now called the primary embryonic induction. And they called this region as the primary inducer or the neural inducer. Actually, the concept of primary embryonic induction, the secondary and the tertiary embryonic induction came quite late after the experiment done by Spimen and Mangold in which they bring out, brought out this concept of um, organizer. Uh, now it is known that embryonic induction is not a single step, but it is a cascade of events in which there are certain primary induction, secondary induction and tertiary inductions. Further, some experiments were done by Peter Newcoop and Osama Nakamura. They brought in the concept of Newcoop center and also helped understand how the organizer is formed. The experiment done in 1970 by Nakamura and Takasaki showed that mesoderm arises from the marginal or the equatorial cells which are present at the border between the animal capsules and the vegetal cells. The animal capsules gave formation of the ectoderm that is they are the prospective ectodermal cells, the vegetal cells are the prospective endodermal cells and thus the marginal equatorial cells are the prospective mesodermal cells. 
and the properties of this newly formed mesoderm can be induced by the vegetal cells which are the presumptive endodermal cells underlying them another experiment done by new pope showed that if the mesoderm is removed the animal cells and the vegetal cells will continue forming their respective organs if they are not brought into any kind of contact with each other but if the animal capsules are brought into direct contact with the vegetal cells then the animal capsules can be induced by the vegetal endodermal cells to form mesodermal structures that is the notochord muscles kidney cells and blood cells they also found that whether these induced animal capsules will form dorsal mesoderm or ventral mesoderm depended upon where the endodermal signals were coming from the ventral or the lateral vegetal cells means which are closer to the sperm entry point induced the formation of ventral and intermediate mesoderm while the dorsal most vegetal cells specified the dorsal mesodermal components the somites and the notochord plus the cells having the properties of the organizers that is the dorsal blastopore lip thus it was concluded that the vegetal cells underlying the prospective dorsal blastopore region are actually responsible for initiating castrulation or that the organizer or the dorsal blastopore lip receives its special properties from signals coming from the prospective endodermal or the vegetal cells beneath and these prospective endodermal or the vegetal cells were named the nucoop center the nucoop center is actually present in the dorsal most vegetal region of the xenopus blastula this nucoop center sends the dorsal mesoderm inducing signals which gives rise to the primary organizer or the spermen organizer which is the dorsal lip of blastopore in the xenopus blastula now this primary uh, the spermen organizer further has a dorsalizing effect it together with the sperm entry point gives rise to the dorso ventral axis so here we have the concept of nucoop center as well as the spermen organizer this was further confirmed by some other transplantation recombination experiments done on xenopus embryos by gimlich and gerhard deal and slack and holowash and elinson now what gives the dorsal most vegetal cells their special properties or what is the molecular basis of spermen's organizer the first and the foremost molecule is the beta catenin also known as the dorsal signal beta catenin is initially synthesized throughout the embryo from the maternal mrna stored in it however later it is accumulated in the dorsal region of the embryo during the cytoplasmic movements that occur during fertilization and early cleavage here there is an important role of other proteins also like wnt11 gsk3 binding protein or the gbp the shebeled protein tcf3 smart2 and several genes like cm1 and twin the second important factor is the vegetal nodal related signal here veg t and vg1 are the vegetal localized proteins which are encoded again by the maternal mrna stored in the vegetal cells they encode certain nodal paracrine factors and they are required for the endodermal formation of the vegetal cells and further the vegetal cells will instruct the cell layers lying above them to become mesoderm the formation of the organizer can better be understood with the help of this flow chart during cortical rotation there is translocation of disheveled protein and wnt protein toward the dorsal side of the embryo where they bind to gsk3 this helps in accumulation of beta catenin on the dorsal side of the embryo now this beta catenin during the process of cleavage enters the nucleus where it binds to tcf3 and thereby activates the genes cm1 and twin thereby producing the cm1 and twin transcription factors on the other hand beta catenin also binds to wedge t proteins in the nucoop center that is the dorsal 
post vegetal region of the embryo whereby it activates uh, tgf beta family that is the nodal related proteins vt1 and activin this helps in phosphorylating and thereby activating the smad2 transcription factor now both these pathways ultimately help in activating the organizer genes that is the cordin nogen and goose quite proteins so ultimately it is the intersecting pathways of both sides which help in activating the organizer and in help, and help in the formation of the dorsal mesoderm the first pathway we can say is the wnp beta cadenin pathway which activates genes encoding the siamua and twin transcription factors the second pathway is the vegetal pathway that activates the expression of nodal related paracrine factors which in turn activates the smad2 transcription factor in the mesodermal cells above them the high levels of smad2 and the siamua twin transcription factors work together in the dorsal mesodermal cells and activate the genes that give these cells their organizer properties the work of smad2 transcription factor can better be understood with this diagram this diagram we discussed during the astrulation of the frog also so here smad2 binds to hhex promoter and in concert with twin and siamua induced by beta catenin specifies the pharyngeal endodermal cells to become four cut endoderm thereby inducing anterior brain development Slightly lower levels of SMAD2 activate the goose coid expression in prospective precordial mesoderm and notochordal cells. Even lower amounts of SMAD2 result in the formation of lateral and ventral mesoderm. So the formation of Spemann's organizer occurs through Newcoop center. and this formation happens in two different stages as has been studied in the amphibian cynopus lepis the first stage is the cortical rotation of the fertilized egg that is during the formation of gray crescent toward the dorsal side of the embryo that lays the foundation of the dorsoventral axis there is localization of determinants to the future dorsal side of the embryo that leads to the formation of new coop center in the dorsal most vegetal cells these new coop center cells remain endodermal in nature they release certain signals which induce the formation of spemens organizer in the region immediately overlying it that is the equatorial region and the spemens organizer becomes dorsal mesoderm it contributes to the four cell types the pharyngeal endoderm the head mesoderm or the precordial plate the dorsal mesoderm primarily the notochord and the dorsal blastopore lip region so what functions the organizer has in the formation of embryo first is the ability of the organizer to self differentiate into dorsal mesoderm that is the formation of precordial plate and corda mesoderm second it has the power to induce its surrounding tissues it dorsalizes the surrounding mesoderm to form paraxial mesoderm or the somite forming mesoderm it dorsalizes the ectoderm to form the neural tube and it initiates the movements of gastrulation in the embryo there is also seen some regional specificity in the gastrulation the anterior part of the archenteron roof induces head formation and is called the cephalic or the head inductor this head inductor further is archencephalic the portion which induces forebrain and deuterencephalic the portion which induces hindbrain the posterior inducing region is known as the trunk or the spinocordial inductor there have also been certain experiments in other organisms to show the primary organizer regions for example the experiment done by w l waddington to show the primary organizer in birds in this experiment hansen's node was inserted between the epiblast and hypoblast of chick embryo it led to the induction of a secondary embryo 
similar to the experiment done by Speedman and Mangold in newt embryos. So Henson's node was considered equivalent to the dorsal blastopore lip of the amphibian gastrula or the Henson's node was considered the primary organizer in chick embryo. However, the posterior one-third of the primitive tray could not induce neural differentiation. That means it did not have any inducing capacity. So it was considered equivalent to the lateroventral lips of the blastopore of amphibian gastrula. There are various types of embryonic induction. The first is the endogenous versus exogenous induction. Endogenous induction is the one in which inductors are produced by the embryonic cells themselves by the process of cell transformation or cell differentiation. For example, endogenous induction is seen during the formation of dorsal lip of amphibian blastopore. Exogenous induction is the one in which some external agent or cell or tissue introduced into an embryo exert their influence on the embryo through contact induction to form an inducer tissue. Now this exogenous induction can be homotypic or heterotypic in nature. Homotypic when the inductor provokes the formation of same type of tissue. Heterotypic when the inductor provokes the formation of a different type of tissue. For example, formation of secondary embryonic excess by an implanted presumptive notochord in case of amphibians. Now let us understand the concept of secondary and tertiary organizers. There is not a single step of embryonic induction but it is actually a cascade of events occurring. Thus there is a sequential inductive interactions going on which help in the formation of a complete organ and this interaction process starts with the primary organizer. For example, in the development of Xenopus I, the cells present in the Argenteron roof act as primary organizer. They induce the formation of optic vesicles in the brain. Further, the optic vesicles act as secondary organizer and they induce the formation of lens in the head ectoderm. This head ectoderm or the lens region further acts as the tertiary organizer and it induces the formation of cornea. Further, cornea also induces the optic vesicles to form optic cup and this is a case of reciprocal induction. So the formation of Xenopus I involves the primary organizer, the secondary organizer, a tertiary organizer as well as a reciprocal induction phenomenon. Then is the concept of instructive and permissive interactions brought forward by Howard Holzer in 1968. In instructive interaction, a signal from the inducing cell is absolutely necessary for initiating new gene expression in the responding cell. In the absence of a signal, the responding cell is not able to differentiate that way. For example, in case of Xenopus optic vesicle experiment, when the optic vesicles are placed under a new region of head ectoderm, they induce it to form lens. And this induction happens by the production and secretion of certain paracrine factors by the optic vesicles. The permissive interactions are the ones in which the responding tissue has already been specified. It just needs a suitable environment to be able to be expressed. For example, many tissues need only the extracellular matrix and the proteins like fibronectin, collagen and laminin to develop though they already have been specified to form the tissue further. So with the discussion of the embryonic induction and competence, let us discuss the lecture in a snapshot. Embryonic induction is the induction of embryonic cells to differentiate into organs in the presence of other cells. Inducer or inductor is the embryonic tissue which exerts the inductive effect by producing paracrine factors as signals and secreting them into extracellular space so as to induce the neighboring cells. Responder is the cell or tissue which responds to inductive effect of the inducer and competence is the ability of responder to respond to inductive effect of the inducer. 
Famous demonstration of nuclear equivalence in new triturus tenuatus cleavage concluded that early amphibian plastomeres are genetically identical. They have identical nuclei and each cell is capable of giving rise to an entire organism. Women also demonstrated asymmetry in the amphibian egg and concluded that the gray crescent area contains cells committed to the initiation of castrulation. Another experiment done by Spayman using differently pigmented nude embryos demonstrated that the gray crescent area contains cells committed to the initiation of gastrulation. Transplantation experiments done by Hans Pippen and his doctoral student Heild Van Gold demonstrated the organization of a secondary axis by dorsal blastopore lip tissue and also concluded that the dorsal blastopore lip forms the specimen's organizer tissue of the amphibian gastrolip. This tissue dorsalizes the ectoderm transforming it into neural tissue and also ventral mesoderm into lateral and dorsal mesoderm. The organizer consists of pharyngeal endoderm, head mesoderm, notochord and dorsal blastopore lip tissues. The dorsal ventral specification begins with maternal mRNA and proteins stored in the vegetal cytoplasm. These include transcription factors such as VEGT and nodal like paracrine factors. And the organizer is induced itself by the new cook center located in the dorsal host vegetal cells formed by accumulation of beta catalyst. Experiments in birds confirmed Henson's node to be the primary organizer in case of birds. Sequential inductive interactions occur to form a complete organ during organogenesis. This involves primary, secondary and tertiary organizers as seen in the case of development of Sinopus I. There also occur reciprocal interactions during inductive interactions and we also discuss the instructive and permissive interactions. So now students, try to think upon certain questions on the basis of your understanding of this lecture. Can you predict the effect of blocking cortical rotation in fertilized xenopus egg upon gastrulation? Think in terms of embryonic induction also. What will happen if the dorsal lip of blastopore from an early xenopus gastrula is grafted onto the ventral side of an early embryo? You can take help from the various experiments that we discussed during this lecture to answer this question. If beta catenin is experimentally removed from an early xenopus gastrula, what will happen? Since we discussed that beta catenin is an important factor in embryonic induction, so you can think of an answer to this question. Can you explain the role of various maternal factors packaged into the vegetal region of the xenopus oocyte? upon gastrulation. So you have to club all the maternal factors that we discussed in this lecture. How does the new coop center induce the dorsal organizer? Also try to find out the role of microtubules in intracytoplasmic movement of proteins during the formation of Spiebens organizer in Xenopus embryo. You can find answers to all these questions in the references given at the end of this lecture. Now we'll begin with the second part of this lecture, that is the fate of germ layers, the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. The fertilized egg or the zygote develops to form a blastula. The blastula further develops the three germ layers to form a gastrula. Now the three germ layers, the ectoderm or the outer layer, the mesoderm or the middle layer, and the endoderm or the internal layer have to undergo organogenesis to form different organs of the body. The ectoderm or the outer layer will form the outer surface, which will form the epidermal cells of the skin, the central nervous system, also known as neural tube, and the neural crest. The mesoderm is further divided into five parts, the dorsal, paraxial, intermediate, lateral, head, the endoderm, forms the digestive tube, pharynx, respiratory system. While the germ cells are differentiated early in the development, so they form altogether differently. So one by one, we will discuss the fate of the three germ layers here. The ectoderm or the outer layer 
forms the outer surface of the body, the central nervous system and the neural crest. The outer surface forms the epidermis of the body of the organism and also various derivatives of the epidermis which includes the scale, nail, hair, the sebaceous and mammary glands, the internal ear, the lens, conjunctiva, cornea, the olfactory epithelium as well as the mouth epithelium. The central nervous system develops into the neural tube which includes the brain at the anterior most part of the body along with it the spinal cord which runs behind the brain till the caudal end of the body. It also develops the cranial nerves as well as the spinal nerves beside developing into retina, pituitary and pineal body. The neural crest develops the peripheral nervous system, the adrenal gland, the medulla, as well as certain cells, melanocytes, Schwann cells. It also develops into branchial skeleton, facial cartilage, and dentine of teeth. The function of gastrulation is to place mesoderm in between the ectoderm and the endoderm. Now the mesodermal regions and their derivatives may be summarized into five different parts. The dorsal, paraxial, intermediate, lateral and head. The regions of the trunk and head mesoderm and their derivatives may be summarized better in this illustration as shown here. The central region of trunk mesoderm is the corda mesoderm also known as the axial mesoderm. This tissue forms the notochord a transient tissue whose major function is inducing and patterning the neural tube under which it lies and also establishing the anterior posterior axis of the body. The notochord extends beneath the neural tube from the posterior region of forebrain and it extends up to the tail. On either side of neural tube further lie thick bands of mesodermal cells as you can notice here which are classified as paraxial mesoderm, then intermediate mesoderm and the farthest are labeled the lateral plate mesoderm. Now tissues which develop from the paraxial mesoderm will be located in the dorsal side of embryo on either side of the spinal cord. Now these tissues will form somites. What are somites? The transitory epithelial blocks of mesodermal cells which are found on either side of the neural tube. And these somites give rise to deeper parts of the skin, that is the cartilage, the tendons, the skeletal muscle, the dorsal aorta, which is formed of the endothelial cells, as well as the dermal and skeletal muscles of the body. The intermediate mesoderm is positioned lateral to the paraxial mesoderm. And this intermediate mesoderm forms the urinogenital system, that is the embryonic kidneys, the gonads, and also the associated ducts. Plus, they also form the outer or the cortical portion of the adrenal gland. Now, farthest away from the neural tube are lying the lateral plate mesoderm. There are two segments of lateral plate mesoderm, the splanchnic mesoderm, which gives rise to the circulatory system of the body that is the heart, blood vessels and blood cells while the somatic mesoderm forms the smooth muscles of the internal organs and the connective tissue of the pelvic and limb skeleton except the limb bones which are somatic in origin. Now the lateral plate mesoderm also helps in the formation of extra embryonic membranes. However, the anterior most paraxial mesoderm does not segment and it becomes the head mesoderm in the head region where it gives rise to the connective tissues and the muscles of head. The endoderm or the internal most layer of the gastrula give rise to the digestive tube as well as the associated organs. It forms the lining of the archenteron and associated glands like the liver, pancreas and gallbladder are endodermally derived. It also forms the pharynx and the associated glands like thyroid, parathyroid and thymus. Endoderm further also develops into the respiratory system. It forms the complete respiratory tube. It also forms the lung cells as well as the eustachian tube. 
So summarizing the fate of the three germ layers, the ectoderm then reaches the outer layer of the embryo. It produces the surface layer or the epidermis of the skin and also forms the brain and nervous system. The mesoderm becomes sandwiched between the ectoderm and the endoderm. It then reaches the blood, heart, kidney, gonads, bones, muscles and connective tissues. The endoderm becomes the innermost layer of the embryo and produces the epithelium of the digestive tube and its associated organs including the lungs. In both the lectures, embryonic induction and organizers, as well as the fate of germ layers, the following books were consulted. Hope you had a good time learning with me. Thank you.